first, and then we'll, we'll go to our regular announcements. But um, yes. so, uh, Hemp Club, as well as the other um, student organizations in the um, Division of um, Applied and Natural Sciences, is doing a team for Relay for Life and jointly earning money for their team um, for donations on their behalf. And so what they are doing is hiring professors if you donate enough money. So I am one of them. So if you want to see me hide, you have to accumulate $100 in the jar um, that's in by the chemistry office. Um, and so if you accumulate 100 bucks, then you'll get to see me on October 24th after seminar. Get to see me pied as well as all of these other <laughs> wonderful people, including the president of the college. And he did get pied, I think, once last year, maybe twice. So so if you, the first pie, I believe, well, the first pie is 100 bucks, and after that, I believe it's like 10 bucks more for the second one. So it's not that much more for the second one. So if you want to see them pied multiple times, you can raise even more money. Um, and donate even more money to have it happen, okay? So, um, whoops. So, here's some pictures from last year's event, so we do get, like, thoroughly covered when this happens. So, anyway, donate for a worthy cause, okay? So now we'll go over to the regular announcements for lab lecture. Um, for this week's lab, we're doing um, experiment seven. Kind of preview that. So, experiment seven is a two part or two week lab, okay? So, we're going to do part one, the first reaction of that experiment. But the pre lab for the experiment, you need to have completed before you come to lab. So, the entire pre lab for all three steps of the experiment have completed before you come to lab this week, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along today. You have a quiz this week. Um, as always, bring calculators, be prepared over um, this week. Since it's a two week experiment, it'll be over what I've covered in lab lecture today, as well as what's in the lab manual related to what I'm covering uh, in lab lecture today. Um, your experiment four report sheets and conclusion, and potentially your notebook, depending on if your lab prof is taking it or not, are due this week, so make sure you have those ready to go. But don't attach the worksheet or the report sheet and the conclusion in your notebook, okay? Just have them kind of slid in, but not permanently attached. I don't know of anyone that wanted it permanently attached. Next week, we'll finish up experiment seven. We'll do the second and third reaction. Also, experiment three, so that was your first report to write on your own without any guide or Erlenmeyer examples or anything like that. So we. Um, Hope that you learned some things from our comments and now are giving you a chance to earn some more points for experiment three by rewriting that conclusion, okay? So it's not the entire report, but the conclusion, um, rewriting it and incorporating the comments that your uh, lab prof gave you as well as on your own trying to improve it, um, that's worth 25 points and the rewrite is due next week, okay? So make sure you have that next week. Um, so make sure in lab this week you fully understand the comments that were in your notebook so you are prepared to rewrite the conclusion. In two weeks we'll be doing experiment eight and your experiment six report sheet and conclusion are due in two weeks. Um, I'm going to start announcing this because it takes a little bit of uh, maneuvering for some students sometimes. Um, if you are attending the Global Health Missions Conference, which is usually around the first week or so of November, um, it's usually students are gone Thursday, Friday, and then into the um, weekend. If you are in a Thursday lab and planning on attending that conference, you need to see me because we need to make sure that you are able to attend a Tuesday lab that week to be able to make up the lab that you would be missing, okay? So if you're in a Thursday lab section, attending the Global Health Missions Conference, see me right after lab lecture today. Okay. okay. My and became a little bit more like a D here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, overview of experiment seven, and then we'll talk in general about polymers, because this experiment in the end you're going to be generating polystyrene. So um, we'll talk about polymers themselves, 
and then more specifics about what you're going to do in lab this week. So experiment seven, there's three reactions involved. And we're starting this week with ethyl benzene. <laughs> and what you're going to do is we want to brominate this. And we're going to use what is called a free radical um, reaction mechanism. Or if you want to be really specific in describing it, it's a free radical benzylic bromination, because we're going to brominate at the benzylic position. And so we're going to use um, NBS. So I'll show you here in a minute what that is. Benzoyl peroxide. We're going to do this reaction in hexane. Um, and we're going to add some heat. We're going to do it at reflux. And this is our step one reaction. Okay? And so um, NBS, first of all, stands for N and bromo succinamide. from this bond here with the nitrogen to carbons with carbonyls. And the end of bromo, it's the bromo is attached to the nitrogen. So um, in the course of the reaction, what you get is it'll get rid of its bromine and what you will form, so we'll walk through how that happens here in a little bit, but what you form is succinamide. So without the bromine, and we just have six in a minute. Um, now our benzoyl peroxide is this guy. We'll talk about here in a little bit why he's important. We're going to brominate in the benzylic position. We're going to form bromoethylbenzene. So that is what you are going to be forming this week. Is your bromoethylbenzene? All right. Next week, what we're going to do is then take this on. We're going to use um, quinoline. We'll talk about next week why it's important that we use quinoline. And again, we're going to be doing this at heat with heat. You'll actually distill your product. Um, and it is called, the type of reaction we're going to be doing is a dehydrohalogenation. So then what we will form is our styrene. So we lose a hydrogen here, we lose a halogen there, that's our dehydrohalogenation, and so we make our styrene. So then the last step is we're going to um, use what is called AIBN. I'll show you that guy here in a minute. And we'll use toluene as our solvent. Again, we're at heat here. So everything for all of these steps is heated. It's 
This step is a radical poly polymerization. So this is where we finally make our polymer. Let's turn it on here. Um, and so the general way to draw our polystyrene is like this. polystyrene that will form in the last step. Okay? And so our AIBN, let's see if I can get them to fit in here, is this guy. Lots of energy in the bonds here. general reaction scheme with a, um, starting with a free radical reaction, then we go to dehydrohalogenation, and then radical polymerization. So we've got three different types of mechanisms going on too with all of our reactions. So I'll leave this guy up here. We'll talk of more detail about uh, the first reaction today, and then we'll talk about the other two next week when we're actually completing them. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of background on polymers and the history of polymers, because they're an important part of our world today and where they came from. So polymers are really huge molecules where you link smaller molecules together. So we'd start with our small molecule is our monomer, our our one unit, so one, one piece of our polymer. If we wanted to put two of them together, then we'd have a dimer. Three of them together, we'd have a trimer. And then if we want a bunch of them together, so these are all examples for styrene, which is what we're going to make and then going down to polystyrene, um, then we have many, many repeat units. And when we're looking at polymers, typically their molecular weights are really, really large, into thousands to hundred thousands grams per mole for molecular weight, so really large, large numbers. Um, so things, you know, things naturally occurring that are examples, DNA, our polymers, RNA, our polymers, proteins, our polymers, they're made up of small individual compounds that are all then linked together, um, polysaccharides, and so it's the, um, small organic compounds, so like when we're talking about just starting with our styrene, that's our monomer, and then we go to our large macromolecule, many, many repeats, and then we've got our um, polymers out of there, okay? And so, um, and the polymers, usually you're talking about things that are covalently linked, covalent bonds in between each of your monomers, um, and you'll set up your reactions such that they keep linking to themselves. So, um, 
we're kind of going to walk through some of the history of polymers.
So one thing with um, natural rubber is if you look at the polymer itself, um, it was a really, it was a good natural um, method for something that would mostly, once it's stretched, go back to pretty much its same size. But it didn't always go back completely to the same size as before when before you'd ever stretched it, okay? So this is before, and then you stretch it out, and then you put it back. It's almost back to its same size, but not quite. So what people had found, and um, this was a pretty important um, discovery as far as the war if it was concerned, but also for the future of polymers, is if you actually made, um, took rubber, and you made vulcanized rubber, and so what they did was they cross-linked, they linked some of these rubber chains together, you stretch it out, it would come back together again to its original size, okay? So this was a huge thing for, um, as far as the polymer industry, but also because of what the driving force was at the time for having more polymers. So vulcanized rubber was a huge, huge product and definitely did help in the war effort. But then what happened, as then all of a sudden this polymer industry took off, okay? And so um, there were polymers, natural and synthetic, for all sorts of different applications. And so what we're gonna look at first of all is some of the architectures of the polymers, then we'll look at more specifically the linkages of the polymers and then some, some specific examples. So there's um, different types of macromolecular architecture, meaning different ways the polymers can be put together in the big picture sense of things. So we could have just a linear polymer. We could have a linear polymer that then has other polymers hanging off, so that'd be called a branched polymer. We could have a star polymer, so we have a common center that all the polymer chains start branching off of. Um, we could have a cross-linked network, so something similar to what they were using for um, the vulcanized rubber. Um, but it works well with other types of polymers as well, so having this cross-link network, because cross-linking it gives it more strength than, it, than the polymer had before it was cross-linked. And then you've got something like this huge, huge guy here, which is common um, naturally occurring systems, but also they've made their synthetic systems that use this idea, where you have this common core, and then you have these branches primary branches off the common core, and then you've got more branches coming off the branches, so then you've got this whole kind of web of polymer in a dendritic network, okay? So these are all examples of different architectures of polymers. And then when we're looking at the individual chains themselves, you can put polymers together in many different ways. Um, you could use just one monomer all the way through, or you can use different monomers to help give that polymer different types of qualities, to put two things um, that are good together as a polymer together instead of having them individually. So one way you could put them, put them together is just randomly have these linkages. You could also have blocks of different monomers, so you could have one type of monomer for a block in the polymer, then have another type of monomer, then go back to the original type of monomer back and forth. Or you can actually alternate just individually each monomer what it is. Okay. And so some examples of these networks and then um, the different copolymers is um, something like saran wrap of, or food wrapping. It's a copolymer of ethylene <coughs> and then acrylic acid. And you, it, you use a certain amount, percentage amount of the acrylic acid to the ethylene. So you don't want a one-to-one -one ratio. You want 15 to 20 percent acrylic acid. The rest of it you want um, to be the ethylene. So the ethylene is a really strong linkage as a polymer. It makes a really strong polymer. And then this acrylic acid, because of all these acid um, parts <coughs> of the molecule hanging off, they make the sticky part. They are what adheres to the silica of the glass. Okay. And so you don't want it too sticky, so you, that's why you limit how much you put in there, only the 15 to 20% versus the strength you need from the ethylene. Another example of copolymers is, you may have seen this uh, 
um, as a demo in like Gen Chem or another class of making nylon, um, taking a dipping oil chloride and 1,6 um, hexane diamine, and you just alternate. This is an alternating polymer where you've got um, one right after the other um, molecules back and forth. So this, like, this is the kind of the monomer of one of each of these put together, and then you just keep linking sets of those back and forth for to make the actual nylon, which there's tons of different things now um, that have some sort of nylon polymer in them. So in looking at um, the polymer we're going to make, first of all, styrene, the monomer styrene, it just has a molecular weight of 104.15. When we look at polystyrene, it can be somewhere between 500 grams per mole to up to 400,000 grams per mole, depending on how many styrene units you put together. Okay? Um, and, and how it is made. Now, what, we're not going to do anything to control chain length or the size of your polymer. Um, and so usually what um, in-class samples come up with is somewhere in the thousands not usually up into these 10,000s or 100,000s. You're somewhere in the thousands for your grams per mole for your molecular weight. But you can manipulate the properties of the polymer, change its molecular weight, ch change its chemical composition, change its shape, change its processing. All of these things changing it then change the actual physical um, characteristics of that polymer and how rigid or how pliable or how strong that polymer is. Okay. So we're going to look at um, the actual synthesis that you're going to be doing this week. So keep this guy up here as our three steps, but we're going to focus now on step one and what's involved um, with that step. So that first reaction of taking the ethyl benzene. and reacting it with our NBS in hexane with heat. Then we'll get our bromoethyl benzene. Um, now we are doing this at heat with heat, um, so that means the heat we're going to use is at room temp. One thing you have to be careful of is because we're also going to have our benzoyl peroxide in there, we'll talk about here in a minute why that's in there. Um, once this reaction gets going, it actually generates heat on its own, okay? So you're going to get this reaction going at reflux, um, and it needs to reflux for an hour. But don't just set it up, get it refluxing, walk away from it. Keep an eye on it, because it actually will exotherm on you, and really all of a sudden start vigorously refluxing. And so you're going to need to turn down the ohmite a little bit once it starts vigorously refluxing. But you don't want to turn it down so much that you stop the reflux, too, because then you've got to get it refluxing again and add more time to the actual reflux time, okay? So really keep an eye on it, okay? Now we've talked about um, a little bit here the NBS um, and a little bit about the benzoyl peroxide. So what's happening with that benzoyl peroxide is this bond right here is actually kind of a weak bond, okay? And 
heat or light can break the bond. And so we're doing this reaction in light. Um, and at reflux, so we're giving the, giving the reaction and giving this guy the heat it needs too. And so what you get when the benzoyl peroxide bond breaks is you actually form a radical right there in the solution. And so you get these benzoyl peroxide radicals from heating it or in the presence of light. And so that's going to become important here when we actually talk about the sequence of events involved in this radical reaction. But that's an initial source of radicals. That's why we're using the benzoyl peroxide. <laughs> um, the NBS we need this because it's our bromine source Okay. now we could just put bromine, liquid bromine in the reaction but we don't want that we don't want the bromine all present at once and all of the bromine that we're going to use all present at once and so um, we're going to use the um, NBS with a little bit of HBr, and you'll form the succinamide that I talked about, and your Br2. Okay, so we get in the end what we would have gotten by just putting liquid bromine in the reaction, but we want a s slow, steady supply of bromine. We don't want all the bromine present all at once. Okay, so that's why we use use the NBS. Um, now this guy tends to throw people off our succinamide because this is a nice white off-white solid. Okay, so it looks like that should really be your product because it looks great. Okay, and we're going to use gravity filtration to remove this from from your reaction mixture at the end of the reaction. The problem with that is it's a byproduct. It is not the product that you want. Okay, so the solid is not what you're keeping. What you're keeping is in the liquid. Okay, the, ethyl, the bromoethylbenzene is a liquid just like the ethylbenzene. So what you want to hang on to is the liquid that you are in your filtrate. Okay? So this guy, the succinamide, once you've filtered, he's going to go in the organic waste, rinse it down with some acetone. Um, then the filtrate is what you're going to hang on to, and you're going to use simple distillation to remove the hexane, and then you're going to store that liquid. That liquid that's left after simple distillation is your product. Okay, so don't don't ever throw him out. Okay. Um, now, just like you talked about and have been talking about in lecture and talked about in Gen Chem, because this is a radical reaction. There's going to be the three different parts to a radical chain that you usually have. So what is what's the first part of a radical chain reaction? Initiation. Initiation, okay. So our initiation step is the formation of our bromine radical. So taking bromine and either heat or light, we're going to have both, making our bromine radical, okay? <coughs> and we'll get uh, two of those out for each bromine that we've got, okay? Um, actually, kind of, eventually, you'll, cal cal uh, stoichiometry will take care of both bromines, but for right, right now, we'll show just the one bromine radical. Um, then, what's the second part of radical chain reaction? Propagation. Propagation. So we've got two propagating steps. First one is going to be our bromine radical reacting with our bromoethylbenzene or with our ethylbenzene. So we've got that 
reaction as well as then we've got a radical that's going to end up on this benzylic carbon. Okay? Um, and then what else is formed from this is our HBr, which is what we need to use with the six bromo succinamide to get the succinamide and get our bromine out. Okay? Um, the second part of our propagation reaction is then the actual bromination here. And so we've got our radical, and then it reacts with bromine, Br2, and we get the reaction here of the bromine with that radical, but we also lose a bromine radical. And so then, we get the product that we want out of this stuff, the bromoethyl benzene, but then we also get our BR radical. Okay? Um, and then what's the last part of radical chain? Termination. And in our case, our termination is any two radicals combined. So we need our benzoyl peroxide because our initiation is starting already with the bromine. Well, we need this step to kind of get to this step. So we need our benzoyl peroxide to be our initial source of radicals to get all of this going, okay? And then once we have the benzoyl peroxide get everything started, then we're going to follow our initiation, um, propagation, and termination step, okay? Um, now, a couple things to notice here is you've got, um, first of all, there's other things that could be brominated. So we brominate at the benzoic position, but we could easily brominate here at the methyl group. Um, your solvent is hexane. You could easily brominate the hexane. So why is it that you see bromination in the benzoic position, but you don't see it in other places? What's, what's so important about the benzoic position? It's resonance stabilized. It's resonance stabilized by the aromatic ring, right? Yeah. So this is going to be something, this is going to be a common trend throughout the rest of organic chemistry. That benzoic position is really important because of the resonance sta stabilization that you get from that aromatic ring. And so what is being stabilized by resonance? What, what's important to have stabilization? The radical, right? Because that's not something that's going to easily form, but it does because of that resonance st stabilization. Okay, so that's um, really key to this reaction. Okay, so once you are done with um, your, re you're going to first start with your reflux, then you're going to cool it down, filter off the succinamide, then you're going to do a simple distillation, then you should have your ethyl bromoethyl benzene. Okay. Now you want to think about your ethyl benzene. You're starting with five milliliters of ethyl benzene. So about how much product should you have? And you're just adding a bromine to it. Five-ish, right? I mean, it's going to be close to what you started with. You're not going to change the volume that much, okay? So in your simple distillation, think about in the distilling pot, that's where you're bromoethyl benzene is going to be, okay? When you're distilling off that hexane, you want to make sure that you get as much hexane as possible off during that distillation so that you're down close to that five milliliters or so of product. That's what you want to have left. So if it looks like in your round bottom you have like 10, 15 milliliters of hexane left, then you're not done with that distillation. You still have quite a bit of bromine left, okay? Or, of, sorry, of hexane left, okay? <laughs> When you are done, um, there's a couple tests we're going to do, and then also want to tell you all the data that you want to gather for, for your bromoethyl benzene. So first of all, you're going to look at a density test versus ethyl benzene. So you're going to look at your product and what happens 
with ethyl benzene as well when you're comparing it to the density of water, okay? So you're going to have, in one test tube, you're going to have your product. In the other test tube, you're going to have ethyl benzene. And you need like half a mil, maybe, or sorry. Um, the other test tube, you're going to, one test tube, you're testing bromoethyl ethyl benzene. The other test tube, you're testing um, ethyl benzene and its relative density to water. So in each test tube, you're going to start out with half a milliliter to one milliliter of water. Okay, not very much at all. Okay, then you're going to add a couple drops, okay, so not very much. A couple drops of your product in one test tube, and the other one is going to be a couple drops of ethyl benzene. And what you want to see is what is that relative density to water. So what should happen with ethyl benzene? Just based on basic knowledge you have of other similar organic compounds, relative to water, what should ethyl benzene do? It should float, right? It should be less dense than, than water, okay? Like in experiment one where the hexane was less dense than water, okay? Um, with your product, so when you halogenate things, what usually happens to its density? It usually increases, right? So what should happen with your product? You should see it relative to water, what should it do? It should sink, right? Relative to the water, okay? And so that's why it's really important to get all the hexane off because if you have a lot of hexane left on your product when you go to do this test, you won't see a difference in relative density because if you have a lot of hexane, your product's still gonna float as well, okay? So your ethyl benzene should be above, less dense than the water, bromoethyl benzene should be more dense than water. The other test that you're going to do is a silver nitrate test. And so you're going to start again with your bromo ethyl benzene. I'm going to draw it just a little bit different here so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay. So we've got regular old silver nitrate like from experiment, experiments you've used in the past in um, Gen Chem. So definite salt here. And what happens is you will actually form a cation with the silver nitrate. So you'll form this cation plus the silver bromide solid. Um, and this will precipitate out. And it's usually a white, yellow white solid. You want to wait wait about five minutes or so, five to ten minutes after you add the silver nitrate to your. Um, you're going to do this test in ethanol, so you'll have your bromoethyl benzene in ethanol and add silver nitrate to it. Then wait about five minutes or a little few, a little bit longer, see what happens. But you should see this um, white to yellow white precipitate crash out of your solution. Okay, and so that's the formation of the silver bromide that's the result of this reaction, okay? So you, ideally with the two tests, you see your bromoethyl benzene's more dense than water, and you get the formation of this yellow to yellow white solid, or white to yellow white solid, that shows that it reacted with the silver nitrate, okay? Another test that you could do is one from experiment six. So what would you use to test for the bromoethyl benzene from experiment six? Flame test, right? Test for halogens. So you also, if you're having, especially if you're having kind of tricky density results, you could also do a Biostein flame test. So the two tests you want to do are the density test and the silver nitrate test. 
But if you have iffy results from either one, then you could go on and use the Biostatin flame test to help you with testing to verify that you've got the right product before you go on to the next step. And same with styrene, we're going to talk about next week, how we verify what we've got before we go on to the next step, okay? Um, now, for the write-up that you're going to do, I've already talked about um, we need our pre-lab um, all done for the entire experiment, okay? Um, something that you need to consider in that pre-lab is we're going to need to figure out three different yields, okay? You've got three different reactions, three different yields. For this particular reaction, first of all, for the yield of step one, you want to make sure that you get a mass and you want a volume of your step one product. Make sure that you get a mass um, and a volume for your step one product. Okay. Another thing is our bromoethylbenzene is really reactive, and we need it to not react before next week. Okay. So you want to store it in a dry, tightly capped vial with not much air in it in the back of your drawer until next week. So when you are all done with it um, for this week, make sure that you've got it in a dry vial um, that's tightly capped in the back of the drawer. To help you with the mass, it'd be a good idea to know the mass of the vial and the cap before you put it in there. Then you can easily figure out the mass afterwards. The other thing is once you've isolated your bromoethylbenzene, don't expose it to the air very often because that's the oxidation with the air is something that can get it to react, okay? So you want to immediately get it to this tightly capped vial and keep it in the vial and only open it when you need to for your two tests, okay? Um, as well as making sure you get the volume before you put it in that vial, okay? Now, for your report, first of all, we've got three reactions. So this is, and it's a two-week um, experiment. This guy is worth 75 points, and not just 50 points, but he's worth 75 points. So you want to do a really good job all along the way, okay? You're going to have pre lab for all three reactions. Before you come to lab, okay? So a usual um, pre lab but it's going to be for all three re reactions in that pre-lab before lab this week. You need a yield calc for each step. Steps one and two, that'll be the same as what you've done before. You're gonna have a theoretical yield, And you'll get, show how you'll calculate a percent yield, okay? So show that in your pre-lab. Make sure you're showing the theoretical yield in grams and how you would use that in grams to calculate your percent yield. And base this off of what's in the lab manual. So base step one off of using five um, milliliters of ethyl benzene and how much, um, the amount of NBS that it tells you. Then base step two off of 100% yield from step one to go on to step two, okay? Step three, we're going to do something different. Our yield, you're going to use your grams of polystyrene divided by your grams of styrene. So we're gonna look at a mass recovery for our percent recovery, we're not looking at a true theoretical yield and percent yield, okay? So grams of polystyrene divided by grams of styrene that goes into the reaction times 100%, okay? It's really important that you get this information because part of this information you're going to need for figuring out your grams of styrene, okay? 
So next week when you form the styrene, you form it with a distillation. What you're probably going to distill off, first of all, is a little bit of hexane. So you need to know your volume that you're starting with so that you know how much hexane you lose in that distillation so you can go back and recalculate how much bromoethylbenzene was used to then form your starting. Okay? So that's where this part comes into play. Okay? Um, so now what I want to show you is I've given you, this is a little bit of basically the physical data table. So I filled out part of that for you, for your pre-lab, to help you out a little bit, okay? So you can copy that down. Um, and then if you have any questions, let me know. Also, if you have any questions about experiment four's write-up, let me know. And if anyone here is seen, is going to attend the Medical Health Missions Conference and in the Thursday lab, make sure you see me before you leave.